Hey friends, welcome to the Leader Assistant Podcast. It's your host, Jeremy Burroughs, and it's episode 240. Today, I'm excited to be speaking with another family man, uh, Joe Rare. Joe focuses on helping small to medium-sized businesses around the world while working from the comfort of his home in Montana. Is that right, Joe? Yes, it is. Uh, what part of Montana? So we're just south of Bozeman. I love Bozeman. I've only been there once. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's a cool town. So you got to tell me, first kind of question is, where does your last name Rare come from? Are you really that rare? Oh, maybe. I think, you know, it's like how my family, I guess, chopped it up when they came to the US. I don't know how many generations ago. And it just kept getting shortened and shortened. And it was Slovakian and something else. And so, yeah, it was some long, unpronounceable thing. And then it, they just chopped it and chopped it as it came. Nice. Tell us a little bit about your career journey and, and where you're at currently. Oh, it's been a wild journey for sure. Entrepreneurship is like that. Um, I've had, you know, quite a few different companies over the years. I had a lot of failures, which is kind of where my my, kind of my method around failing fast comes in. And I think that the faster you can go make mistakes and figure things out, the quicker that you can get to the next step or the next opportunity. And so I take that same approach and I pass that down to our team and everybody in our company has that, you know, mentality. I've had, you know, like I said, multiple companies where we are today, we, you know, I built Level 9 Virtual, which is my VA company, basically from the idea of one of my team members said, hey, you know, we keep telling people how and where to go hire virtual assistants. You know that you could just do that and provide the service and you probably make money. You know, my whole thought was, I don't want to operate the company. So if we could figure out a way to have you guys operate it, then let's do it. And we created this model that we've launched six companies using this model where I can get involved in the beginning. You know, I'm more of the visionary and we put integrators in place. We put people in place to actually run and operate the companies. My goal is to get into a business, start a business, launch something, and then have a team scale it and run it. I reverse engineer the way that I think most people get into a business is they do it with the intent. I want to build something or I want to be a part of something with the intent that I'm going to have freedom, right? Some level of freedom, whether I want to do the thing my way, I want to, you know, I want to have free time, I want to have financial resources, whatever freedom it means to you. Most people are starting businesses for those reasons. So the way that I look at it is go, okay, I'd like to start a business that fits around my lifestyle. I don't mind working for a period of time, but then I have to be able to get myself back out of it, you know, and then it needs to be run by my team. So yeah, so then that's, that's where we are today. What's kind of a few of those? You said six of them, what are a few of those? Yeah, I have a marketing agency in the wedding industry and we provide a marketing system for wedding venues. I'm a partner in five wedding venues, so that's another one. Level 9 Virtual. And then uh, this company we launched about 90 days ago, it's called Visitor Match, and that is identity resolution, anonymous website visitors converted into user profiles. So when people have a website and their business is dependent on a website, we can actually match the anonymous people that hit your website, and we can give you their contact information so that you can reach out and create sales opportunities. And so that business has kind of exploded over the past 90 days. Wow, so give us kind of a summary of level nine virtual is it a virtual assistant firm so we have clients who have 20 and 30 assistants we have who handle marketing and general administration admin and prospecting and you know outbound you know outreach technical things website development you know a lot of a lot of different support roles whether it be in the marketing realm or whether it be something you know more administrative we do it all and we have you know you can get dedicated virtual assistants that do just that or if you need something that's more of a project-based focus we have project-based services where you can just buy a block of hours, get a whole bunch of things off your plate and say, I need to, I have all this graphic design work that I want to get done and, and I can assign it to somebody who's done a thousand projects and get it done. I need somebody to help me update my website. You can assign just that project, get it done and only pay for, you know, a block of hours. So we have project-based work. We have dedicated. I have an executive assistant. You know, I have assistants that do podcast outreach. So they get me interviewed on podcasts. That's how I ended up with you, right? So my team reaches out and they find podcasts that might make a lot of sense for me to be interviewed on and help our brand grow, but also provide hopefully some insight to somebody. Maybe somebody will ask me the right question and they'll get that right answer that really, really helps one person. We really have a plethora of services. The executive side of things is pretty cool because I haven't checked my own email first in probably three years. So I have somebody who literally scours my email, make sure that, you know, what I need to see versus what I don't need to see. And so it makes my life a lot easier. I have a lot more freedom. I have a lot more free time because I have somebody else actually running the show. And so there's a few quick little tips. Yeah. So how does the, you know, we talk about business process standardization 
What's maybe another, to go a little deeper and, and double click on the email management, how have you standardized that process so that you can help other executives do the same with their assistant or so that you can train the assistants that you hire how to do that? And then even if the assistant's listening to the show right now, they're thinking, all right, well, you know, I manage my executive's inbox. I need some tips. One of the first things to do, if you're the business owner trying to get hire an assistant or whatever, one of the first things to do is, is it's challenging to give up your inbox. A lot of people don't like doing it and they feel very kind of confused on whether it's like something that you should hand off or it's to be something personal. The way that we kind of structure it is we do it very similarly to where, how we have our Slack account set up. You know, if it's client type emails, they'll go into one inbox. We have anything that's urgent, emergency type stuff goes into another folder. Anything that's just staff related, if it's HR related, if it's finance related. So every division of the company, if there's emails that are involved from any division, vision anywhere. They all have their own inbox. If it's client facing stuff or if it's fulfillment stuff, if it's, uh, you know, it could be tech, you know, subscriptions and things that we have, those are all going in, into one. The goal is, is number one organization. That's the easiest. That, I feel like that's the easiest part of it because you can just go through and figure out some basic categories that make sense. And then, you know, you set up your rules and everything else. And then all we have our assistants do is go in and review fires. Fires are really the only thing that's urgent. There's fires and opportunities. Unfortunately, opportunities don't hit your inbox every single day. Most people spend all of their time focused on fires and they end up in their inbox and there's just a plethora of stuff in there. And most of it is a distraction. It's actually not anything necessary. And so what we do is, is over time, our VAs will actually learn, like what would our typical response be if we got email A? And so then we go, okay, here, just send them this. And, the, and, and actually the summary of all of that gets sent to me in Slack. So I actually don't check the email, I actually check Slack. And it's, hey, here's the five pressing things. I'm not really sure how to address these. Oh, hey, say this back, say this back, say this back. Like you got it, it happened to you earlier, right? You emailed and said, hey, we need to kind of, you know, move move the appointment. Hey, tell them back, you know, send them back. I can't do it, right? Because she didn't know what I had going on. Little things like that, it was super fast. It all happened in Slack. I could do it on the fly. I don't have to log into my email. I don't have to sift through everything that's in there. It's super quick and my team can, can actually do it for me. And so those are, I mean, just a couple quick quick things with the organization of the inbox. But then the most important thing is just to start to learn how the business owner or the, you know, whoever it is that you're working with, how they would actually respond to things. Like what's their, what, what's their phrasing? How do they communicate? What words do they typically use? I'm a super simple, like kind of laid back person. I'm not very professional <laughs> at all. So my communication isn't professional. And so everybody knows they can just use like short messages to send back because that's literally the, what I do. And so they'll send those short messages on my behalf. Nope. Sorry. Can't do five o'clock. You know, Joe's daughter's got volleyball or whatever, right? And they could send it back. But the whole goal of it is to recognize what's important and put that in front of in front of my face. And I'll speak from my experience. Put that in front of my face so that I can actually address just the things that are important. And to be honest, the more you get through it and you have somebody kind of comb through your inbox for you, the smaller the amount of important things actually show up on a daily basis. And so there's many days that I literally don't respond to anything. I have There's nothing for me to actually say in regards to an email reply. My my teams figured it out. So I don't know if that helps, but I mean, you know, just the, the basic, the, the initial organization is, is a big deal. We take it for the divisions of the company, marketing, sales, you know, HR, finance, uh, each of the division of the companies, they each have their own inbox. We try to pass and set up rules, have all of those things come through. It's a matter of prioritizing the urgency versus the mundane. You can get back to the mundane and that's, you know, I guess one last piece of it too, is if there's a whole bunch of just things that obviously aren't important, but they still don't know really how to address it. I get that in one summary and all I have to do is reply to it in Slack and then they send it out. So I hope that helps. And I have a similar system where I, I, I still use email, but I split off all the like, I have a bunch of automatic filters yep. and rules in Gmail and it splits off a bunch of the junk and the FYI stuff yep. to separate section so that the things that he actually sees, my CEO actually sees in his inbox are generally things that he needs to see or he needs to reply to. Right. Um, and there's still some stuff I have to filter out, but it's a lot better than all these notifications and spam things coming in. Is there anything specific you do to filter those? Uh, there are certain things like I'll even have a rule or a tag 
tag where I'll say, if the word unsubscribe. Yes. <laughs> block that out. Filter that. Dude, one of the coolest things, like I'll go in every now and then. This was, and I didn't even know this. My assistant came up to me and, and told me this. Cause I was like, all of a sudden, you know, it's like, I just check my, I check the inbox and just make sure like nothing's getting crazy. And like, there's just like nothing in it. And like this, there's no possible way. I get hundreds of emails a day, like easily. There's no way there's nothing in this inbox. And I was like, how are you doing that? Because that's a lot of work to get through and like, you know, pull all those and put them. And then they told me that exact thing. The rule is if the word unsubscribe is in there, right? Pull it into its own separate thing. So I went and checked that that folder and they don't delete it for, you know, a period of time, right? And they'll scour through and make sure nothing slipped through. But it was fascinating to go check it out and see. It's all, it's all trash. And I'm like, oh my Lord, how much stuff have I subscribed to that I didn't even know about? So super interesting. Wow. So, okay, that's awesome. So super helpful tips. Tell us in general though about recruiting and training and managing virtual assistants. You know, the hard part is I don't do it anymore. <laughs> So, you know, and that's, and that's part of the beauty of it. I have an entire HR team and they do the recruiting, but we use, I mean, we use every channel available from whether it's LinkedIn or it's Facebook, it's, you know, Facebook groups, it's, you know, LinkedIn groups, it's running ads on social media to most of our team happens to be overseas. So we use all of the, the platforms over there. We also have a team that scours, you know, college graduates and tries to get newly people who are, are in the process of graduating and try to get them to come in. And then, you know, that recruiting process, we use a platform called Bamboo HR for our recruiting stuff and you know where our team and, and all of our HR stuff is sitting. That makes it really helpful when we have a new opening. We actually send it out to our, our entire staff first and let people that are already in our ecosystem take the first shot at it. And if they if they want the role and there's you know the opportunity for them. So we give them that. The management of virtual assistants has been interesting. So it's changed over the over time. We've needed more people, then we needed less people to manage than the volume and then we needed more people people. And now we've just got a really, really good system. And our focus is on building culture and it's doing fun things. You know, with people being virtual, the challenge is holding relationships while nobody's face to face. Right. And even, you know, the majority of our team is in the Philippines and with our team in the Philippines, the challenge is that, well, they don't all live like next door to each other. It's not like they can just like take a road trip and, and, and all get together. Right. They could be completely on separate islands all over the place. You know, some people are on the province, some people are in the city and it really kind Kind of depends where the, where they're located and so doing you know a couple times a year we do events where we actually get everybody on and you know this kind of became a normal thing especially during covid where we would get on and we do every beginning of the year we do a huge kickoff party the end of the year we do stuff for you know the holidays kind of middle of the year we do kind of state of the union type stuff but there's all these games and and just fun stuff for people to get involved with and then we you know we even we have teams of people who you know get together you know virtually obviously to plan these events and so you know, we'll put together teams that can actually go do that. And or I guess committees would be an easier way to call it. And so trying to create ways that people are developing culture, you know, we have an internal Facebook community where it's just our team and everybody in the entire company who work with clients and so forth, they're all available right there to work together. And then we have coaches who help oversee all the VAs and make sure that they have support when they need it. So I know that's kind of a lot, but yeah, there's, there's a ton of moving parts, especially when, you know, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of, of uh, VAs and I'm not even sure what we're at today. Day, but I say, yeah, I was curious how many you have on the, on the yes, we were just over 800 a while ago. I'm not sure where up or down we are, you know, currently, but yeah, so it's a lot. How many do you know roughly how many clients? So total clients just over 900 and we've worked with over 4,000 just over the past few years, yeah, especially because we have so many projects. That's why it's kind of difficult and I'm kind of like humming and hawing because we have the project based side of things that is just like, hey, come in, get some projects done and then you're gone. Right. And then we have dedicated, which is people who actually hire a team and then they build their their staff around our you know systems and, and our VAs. And so it's always kind of up and down. We have tons of project people. You know, like I just spoke at an event and we brought on 60 something clients in like an hour and it was kind of nuts. And so all of a sudden it's like, whoa, hold on. Okay, we've got a bunch of new VAs that I have to work to. So yeah, it was pretty fun, but it gets wild. Yeah, Lot, so lots of people, lots of personalities. So assistants listening who work, you know, norm, you know, quote unquote, normal full-time salary position, but they're thinking I want to do some extra side hustle 
hustle virtual assistant work, or maybe I want to become full time remote virtual assistant and move to Hawaii or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what do you guys have any opportunities for assistance? Like, are you generally hiring on your on your website, or is it more of a word of mouth recruiting uh, system you're in? You know, I believe there's a careers page on our site typically, and I should check that because I don't know. I know that there was one that literally just goes to the the job openings through our Bamboo page. But yeah, so anything that's open is available. And and if people want to do that, I mean, we have clients coming in every single day. We have job openings constantly. So, you know, we have this delicate balance within the business that we actually have two sides that we have to manage. One is we have to get clients because clients hire the VAs. Then we have to go get assistants and staff them and staff them for the clients. And there's this delicate balance of having enough assistants for the number of sales, but then enough sales for the number of assistants. And so like, it's really this delicate balance. So it kind of just depends what capacity in which direction we're looking. Sometimes it's like we need more assistance and then other times we need more sales. So it kind of, you know, it's up and down. Okay. I love how you're like, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't done that in a while. I don't know. I, haven't... <laughs> I know it's not very fair, is it? <laughs> no, it's great. Cause it's like, what's your tip for part of this is the business process standardization and just outsourcing. But like, I know a lot of executives have a really hard time. You mentioned the email, letting go of their email, but like you're actually saying, Hey, you know, you guys are running the actual business. So how, what are, what are the tips for letting other people, trusting other people and setting them up well to run, Yeah, you know, your baby, if you will. There's a couple things. The first thing that I would say is like, make the shift in your mind that that's what you want, that you want that type of a business because that isn't a normal business. Like me, I snowmobile almost every day in the winter. Like <laughs> like I don't work in the winter period and I snowmobile almost every day. And so when it starts to get chilly and I'm like, cool, I'm going to put on a, you know, like a long sleeve, I'm starting to get excited because the snow is, you know, I hear the snow, it's supposed to snow in Yellowstone this week, like this weekend. So I'm like, okay, we're coming. But anyhow, so like they have to decide that that's what they want. And as an entrepreneur, I'm somewhat lazy. I don't want to work. So my mentality is very different than somebody who's kind of addicted to their job. They really like the high pressure. They like all of those things. I personally don't. I so much would rather sit at my daughter's volleyball game or take my kids horseback riding. That's the only thing I really care about is family time. That's the first thing is is the mentality and the, and I call it an agreement, making an agreement with yourself that you're gonna get out of your business and you're gonna allow somebody else. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, you know, not being afraid to allow your team to fail. So as you build this team, it's, you know, it's the first thing I said, you know, in my intro was failing is the fastest way to success. And a lot of times what happens is when people hire, they don't even want to realize that they made a mistake in the hiring process. So they let the person stick around and just completely screw things up and it never works out and they never get out of their business. And you know, they never put the right person in place because they're kind of ego stuck in the fact that I made a bad hire. And I think go out, fail, realize that you're going to suck it at hiring first. That's going to be awful. So hire quickly, fire faster, let your team, team make mistakes though. And that's when you're going to find who ends up being gold. When you allow them and you give them the space to make mistakes and then you watch how they rebound, you'll know if they're the right people or not. And when they don't go make the same mistake twice, you go, okay, great. This is perfect. This is the right person, you know, for this role. And I think that a lot of people are just afraid to kind of let that happen. We put together a budget and say, look here for this project, we have this budget. And if you screw it up, we're prepared to lose it. But we believe that the investment in you, the the investment in whatever this is going to be that we're going to put resources forward to allow you the opportunity to go do something right, screw something up, but fix it in the end. And eventually it'll end up ROI positive. And so I'm really a huge fan of allowing people the space to go screw up, but then watch how they respond. And that'll tell you everything you need to know. Nice. That's awesome. Well, Joe, thank you for so much for being on the show. I want to finish up with kind of a different question than I've than I typically do. Okay. And this question would be like, what's the biggest mistake you've made specifically as it relates to working with an assistant? Perfect. I know exactly what it is. I, this one, I made it last year. It's been actually, I think this month is a year. I believed that this person who worked in our company should be at a higher role, uh, an executive role, to be honest. And I tried to push her into this role that I felt was the next move in her career. And I said, look, like, look this is where we're going to take you. This is where we're going to get going. And there was resistance on her side in the fact that all of the, and this is a rock star. This was a rock star. She was one of the absolute best. And all of a sudden there's this resistance. And I'm like, I can't figure this out. I'm telling her the path to literally become an executive. And all we need you to do is X, Y, and Z. And there was just massive resistance, like no follow through out of nowhere. And I could not figure it out. And then she ends up quitting. So she 
resigned, you know, highest paid person in the entire company. She resigns, she moves on. And it came to me later and I realized I pushed her where she wasn't supposed to go. Right. And I put her, I was trying to put her in a role that number one, she wasn't suited for. If I got honest with myself, she wasn't suited for that role. She would have failed in it. And I would have been responsible because I put her in that role and I pushed her to do it. And secondly, I didn't create the right environment for her or the right, I guess, relationship for her to feel like she could tell me that she didn't want it and that it wasn't right for her. And so I didn't set her on a path that was the best thing for her overall, which would have then been the best thing for the company. And that was hands down, probably the biggest management mistake as far as people go that I've ever made. And it's changed how we look at managing our staff. And you know, it's like, I want everybody the freedom to go fail and fix it. But I also want to guide them where they want to go. And so that that's been huge. But yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. I actually was one of our leader assistant a Zoom chats today. And we were talking about similar concept of, you know, these assistants that are really crushing it and they're growing and they're owning more and more responsibility and doing oftentimes doing executive level tasks. People are like, or people around them are like, okay, well, when are you going to move on to a different role? When are you going to work your way up the corporate ladder? And they're like, I, I just like being an assistant. Yeah. This is where I'm at. This is where I'm good. This is what I, what I want to do. And you know, some cultures and some environments don't really encourage that and like support that. They're like, well, you need to you need to go out of that role if you're wanting to do what you're you're trying to do. And so it's sticky, sticky situation. Yeah, it's very interesting, especially if your personality, like mine, mine, like I'm, I consider myself high achiever, like always, you know, wanting to accomplish more. You know, it's like if I'm snowmobiling, it's like that mountain's higher. Let's climb that one. You know, with my kids and and you know sports and everything else. I mean, you know, they want to get better and better and better. And so it's you know the next training, the next coach, and and every opportunity we can for those things because that's our that's how we're wired. And not everybody is wired that way. And so I think I did a really poor job of recognizing how somebody was wired to give them the best opportunity for themselves. And I really screwed that up. And um, so it's something that I look at every single day and I'm hoping, you know, that I'm also creating the environment where somebody feels comfortable to let me know, hey, Joe, like that's not the direction I want to go. You know, this is what I want to do. And I love what I'm doing. And that's it. Awesome. Well, Joe, thanks again for being on the show. What's the best place for people to reach out and connect and learn more about Level 9 Virtual or you and, and all the different uh, projects? No, the easiest is level9virtual.com. So level Level number nine virtual.com, or you can always email me, Joe at level nine virtual.com, and my assistant will get back to you. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thanks again, Joe. You got it. Thanks a ton. I appreciate it.